by Patrick Akande uh, from the University of Georgia, and he'll be speaking on the generalization of Euler's recurrence of the partition function. Thank you, Frank, for the introduction. Uh, yeah, as he said, I'm going to talk about the generalization of the partition function, which is I'm going to talk about a bunch of recurrences that I have discovered, new recurrences I've discovered about the partition function. But before we start, we need to talk about what a partition is. A partition of a natural number let's call it n, is a collection of parts where the sum of the parts equal to that number. A good example is what we have here. We usually use lambda as our variable for partitions, like 4, 3, 3, 1 is a partition of 11, because if you add 4, 3, 3, 1, it usually, it, 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 it's 11. The partitions are usually written in weekly decreasing order, just for like a range of purposes. And now let's go to our partition function. Our partition function is what we're going to call p of n, and it denotes the number of partitions of n. And we're going to let p of 0 equal to 1, because we're going to let the anti-partition, which is 0 partition, to be 1. And we're going to let uh, p of n equal to 0 if n is negative in any sort. Now we're going to go to Euler. Euler has been working a lot on partitions back in, back in his days. And what he actually was looking at was the generating function of the partition function. The generation, the generating function of the partition function is exactly this series right here, one minus q to the n, the reciprocal of that. And what Euler also found was also looking at was generalized pentagonal numbers. Pentagonal numbers are usually written of this form: three n squared minus n over two, where n is an integer. The pentagonal numbers are usually looked at of positive index, like the p of one, p of two, p of three is one five. 12, but they're also pentagonal numbers of negative index. That P of negative 1 is 2, P of negative 2 is 7, P of negative 3 is 5, and of course, 0 index is 0. But now let's talk about the geometric definition of pentagonal numbers. Pentagonal numbers are usually derived when you actually draw a pentagon on the outside and keep using it from there. A great example is this. We just start with the one dot, which is the 1. And then we go to the five dots, which is because pentagon, we're gonna make a five. And now what we're gonna do is we're gonna make a pentagon on the outside of this, like here, as you can see right here. And the pentagonal numbers is the sum of those dots. Like for example, this is one, this is five, and this is 12. And the ones of the negative index are the ones that are not in this bold line as right here. Like for example, this one is two, and these ones are seven. And now let's talk about the relationship between pentagonal numbers and partitions. The relationship between them is that the number of partitions with distinct parts of odd length is not the same as the number of partitions with distinct parts with even length of pentagonal numbers. That is a wordy thing to say, but here is exactly what I mean. If you write the partitions of five that are distinct, five, four, one, and three, two, Take the ones of odd length and those of even length, that, that, that some of those will not be the same. Six isn't a pentagonal number, but six, five plus one, four plus two, three plus two plus one, the odd lengths are the same as the even lengths, but they're the sum of those. So they, they're exactly not the same. And with this, Euler deduced the pentagonal number theorem. This product here, which is the reciprocal of the of the generating function of the partition function is actually equal to the power of the pentagonal numbers and the coefficient depends on the index of the pentagonal number. And now combining both the generating function and this pentagonal number theorem, we're gonna Euler deduce the definition of the partition function. But before we even get to that, there are some special numbers that we need to go through first. This is what I call the semi-pentagonal numbers. The semi-pentagonal numbers depend on the bolded line you saw on the pentagons that I created before. And they're usually bounded either above or below by a generalized pentagonal number. So I'm gonna separate this into two different parts. So the first part is the left semi-pentagonal numbers, which is bounded on the left by a num paused by a pentagonal number with non-positive index. Like for example, 0, 2, and 7. And 
is usually bounded by the next pentagonal number. So like two, three, four, five is the next one, but five will not be in this. 12 is the next one, 12 will not be in this. One is the next one, one will not be in this. And then we have the right term pentagonal numbers, which is literally just shifting everything to the right. Having this one by one, having this three, four, five, having this eight, nine, 10, 11, and 12. Now that we have the semi pentagonal numbers, let's talk about Euler's recurrence for a quick second. So Euler found that that piece of n is equal to piece of n minus one plus piece of n minus two plus piece of n minus five minus piece of n minus seven. This recurrence definitely speeds up computation. It's pretty fast. It only takes like a few seconds to calculate, for example, the partition of 200, which is this big number here. And I can tell you, I also coded the next one for the partitions of 800, which is exactly this big number right here. So you see this recurrence is not exactly linear. It basically bursts through as the numbers get really big. And now let's find a formula for this, for this partition function. So now the formula for the partition function is actually this. A piece of n is equal to piece of n minus the pentagonal number. And the coefficient, again, depends on the pentagonal numbers index. Now, for example, one and two are of index one, index negative one, but these two are positive. Five is index two, seven is index negative two, both of these are negative, which is coming from here. And now that we have this, let me show you an actual new recurrence here, which is what I'm gonna call the semi-pentagonal number theorem. The semi-pentagonal number theorem goes like this. If we take the same product, but without that last term, which is this one minus Q, and if we rewrite this as this, and checking that Euler's pentagonal number theorem gives this is exactly this series that we have right here, you get exactly this. One, minus q squared minus q cubed minus q to the fourth plus q to the seventh plus four, so on. You realize two, three, and four are semi, are semi pentagonal numbers were the left ones. This is q to the zero, which also counts q to the seven and so on and so forth. So you could rewrite this as the sum right here. The sum which is that is the power of the semi pentagonal numbers and it depends on the set where it lies. And using the fact that this whole thing is still equal to this right here, you could get an actual new formula for the partition function. So the partition function, you could rewrite this as one plus the same thing, it, depending on the semi pentagonal numbers, and it depends on this, oh, the coefficients depend on the set which it lies in. Here is a nice few things to write up. A nicer way to write it. So we have like one plus p m minus two, p m minus three plus p of m minus four minus p of m minus seven, and so and so forth. And now that we have this, we talked about this more abstractly. So let's talk about this more directly. So I went on a more direct approach to find an actual another recurrence for the partition function. So let R be a real number and L be a natural number. So let it partition, ha, the natural numbers with this set. So we're gonna call this set NRL, whereas N is a natural number and the floor function of N divided by R is equal to L. So our N here depends on both R and L. So it turns out there exists a family of functions, which I'm gonna call our H sub RL of N, such that this is true each of our L when restricted to this set will actually equal to piece of A. So if you, find, if you can find different layers of both R and L, you can always restrict it to that set and always just get piece of A. I'm not gonna talk about the formula for it because it's very extensive, but I can tell you something that is nice that is derived from this. So here's the second theorem that I have. So if R let it be less than two and M be a natural number, there exists, I'm gonna call this big L, 
that is in the natural number such that this is true, that a sub i l is equal to p of m for all l less than equal to l. So it doesn't even depend on the set that we talked about before. This is just for any natural number, m. So since you could do this, this by definition of limit, we could just take the limit of this as l approaches infinity. And by this extension, well, I'm going to call it a generalized formula. If R is less than equal to two, P of n is equal to the infinity version of this. And this is the actual formula for this. I'm going to call this a F of n R. I'm also not going to tell you what this is. It's very extensive. Uh, plus this, which looks familiar. I'm going to show you in a second. Plus this right here. This is checking the right same Bertalo numbers. I'm putting them back into this. And we're having this weird floor function going on right here. So it combines both Euler's pentagonal number theorem and also combines the definition of the right semi pentagonal numbers. And if you realize, if we let r be small enough, I'm going to let it be less than one. F sub n of r I'm gonna, is going to equal to this um, index function. So it'll only be one when it's zero and zero anywhere else. So when this happens, this is going to be greater than n. So this will basically be nothing. The series will completely go away. And since you have this, you have directly p of n is equal to one when it's zero and zero otherwise plus this which is Euler's recurrence of the partition function that we have. Now we have this, let's talk about a few observations that can be made from all this. First, there is, a, there is actually a relationship between the functions that I gave and the representations of S of L. The relationship I also kind of explains it right now because it requires like a lot of extensions, but this L that happens here and this L that happens here, they are both actually the same. There's actually a direct relationship between these two. And the second one, which is the most important one to me is the recurrence in, I'm gonna call this in our F sub NR. I'm not gonna again explain the formula where it is, but well, here are some of the observations that I made. First, f of 7n plus 5. And if we let our r be 4, you actually be congruent to 0 mod 4. And actually, this has a direct, a direct sequence. That this is actually equal to 4 times um, a power of n, so n squared in this case. And the next observation I made was that if you do it for 5n plus 4 and let r be 4 itself, it's actually going to equal to the nth second hexagonal number. I still do not know why this is important, but it does show up as a sequence that we have. And if you're very related with partition theory, you know why these sequences are very important. 7n plus 5 or 5n plus 4. They're both related with Ramanujan congruences. So what I am trying to explore is the relationship between H sub R L and the Ramanujan congruences. Because H sub zero L is actually equal to this, F sub N, F sub N R. And as soon as you get higher, that's what I'm actually trying to find in this context. And now with these in mind, I want to say thank you for letting me, um, say stuff in this lecture, I'm inviting you to this conference. All right, thank you very much. Uh, questions for the speaker? I have a question. Yep, please. Patrick, do you have, our, does that same kind of game that you played of doing that kind of decomposition where you end up with terms that look like the pentagonal number theorem and then terms with those um, floor functions and stuff. 
Does that approach work with other partition theoretic types of functions? Yes. I'm also trying to deal with uh, the distinct partitions as well because I've actually found an, another formula for distinct partitions, which I also could not include here, but yes. Does it give something like a pentagonal number theorem type thing, like for those partitions with distinct parts? Yes, but it's no longer pentagonal numbers. It also depends on the distinct partitions with odd parts. Oh, cool. That's very interesting. Thank you, that was a great talk. Thank you. Uh, any further questions? Actually, so Patrick, uh, I just want to say hi. And you, you've obviously been, been very busy since we last spoke. And I'm, I'm very excited about the things you're talking about today. So thank you for the talk. Just to follow up on something that you, you mentioned um, to Robert just a moment ago, that part, I, in, in, since you're new to partition theory, I wanted to make sure you were aware that the number of partitions of n into distinct odd parts uh, so that you just that set you're just talking about those are equinumerous with the number of self conjugate partitions. I think that's a theorem due to Sylvester. So that might be something that it, you know since they're the, the same size. There's a there's a neat bijection between the two classes. That might be something that that you want to consider as you go forward with that. And okay, of course, thank you. We, we, can, we can talk anytime, just you know, drop me an email. Drew, thank you for that for me as well, who is also oh, okay. new to the field of partition theory. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Further questions? Okay, uh, let's, let's all uh, virtually thank the speaker again for a very nice talk. And uh, so the next talk will be in seven minutes. Frank, are you the um, referee of this session? Uh, yes, uh, such um, as it is. I'm just telling you, and I had texted you this earlier in the chat, I'm undergoing a power outage right now. Uh, and so I do have over 50% juice in my laptop. Okay. And I'm good on my phone, and I'm using my phone's, uh, like, you know, hotspot. Uh -huh. but, I mean, I'm just saying, if for some reason I totally fizzle out, um, it is not due to lack of enthusiasm or ideas. Um, but rather due to a uh, lack of energy uh, in my devices. <laughs> in one of them. Understood. Thanks for letting us know. Well, thank you. I don't think that I should, though. I don't expect that. Fizzling, uh, not anticipated. You're giving your talk outdoors. That's an inspired idea. Oh, I always work outdoors, and I teach all of my classes outdoors, too, um, inclu including uh, real-time live in Zoom for safety of my students. Ah, very nice. So, um, of course, not on rainy days. Then we just do uh, online. Yeah. <laughs> Am I the, I'm the next speaker, right? Uh, you are, yeah. Yeah, I'll get prepped. Be right back. Mm-hmm.
you know, when, when Robert said he was outside, that he had no power. I thought he was outside because he would be in the dark if he were in, indoors, you know, but uh, I teach all my classes outdoors here. Uh, so be out on the deck. Well, we're having nice weather for it. It's not raining and it's not, the, the temperature's a lot better this week, uh, but there's been a lot of rain here in some parts of, mm -hmm. of our world down here. Yeah, so myself, I was, I've been doing online teaching, but I, I was going to do uh, in-person office hours outdoors once a week, and I put it on hold for a few weeks because there are a huge number of COVID infections. But things got better, and I was all set to meet my students outdoors, and then Hurricane Sally hit. <laughs> so, so much for that idea. A lot, a lot of rain. Hmm. You can have it in a bar. All the students will show up if you hold it in a bar. <laughs> 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 yeah, I'm not sure I dare go to a bar right now. <laughs> yeah. Gosh. I know. First, we're, we're in a small town here, and the number of cases, positive cases, shot up when the students came back. And of course, yeah, it opened at the same time as the public schools were opening up. So it's, and, you know, they don't really tell us any information. They just tell us. So many cases on campus, so many cases reported locally. Uh, so many people died. And it was a 72 year old man or a 36 year old woman and things like that. So uh, I just stay in. You know. Yeah, and I thought. Um... I thought here at South Carolina, I, I'd kind of predicted they'd pull the plug and move everything online after a couple of weeks, but uh, they decided to stay the course and things looked scary, but now, uh, now the case numbers are going down. So maybe we won't have any deaths or serious illnesses. But the number of cases are going down in Georgia, the number of deaths has jumped back up the last few days. So, uh, uh, which is the ultimate number that you want to watch, you know, the number of deaths. Uh, we live in a small mm. rural community here, and we've had 25 deaths, which is Oof. pretty big for mm. us. Uh, That's a huge chunk of your town. Yeah, well, the, the county is, I think, 80,000, but... Uh, 25, and, and Georgia's had 6,000 deaths in the state. So I'm sorry to hear that about your community, David. Well, maybe we'll get through this. It's almost like the powers that be decided we had to open up and bear an acceptable number of deaths, you know? Yeah. Uh, yeah. And different they never tried to tell us what an acceptable number of deaths was going to be because they didn't really know. They just thought, well, we got to do it. But, uh, they like, they like took it up from the obvious number of zero. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> huh. So you get to meet with your students outdoors. Do many of them come? Yes. I have, I give my students the, uh, high flex options so they can choose to do it online or outdoors or online uh, like asynchronously. So I just kind of uh -huh. broadcast from outdoors. I mean, like I get like two or three students at most per class session that show up outdoors. Very few of them actually take the option. Uh, yeah. And um, so it's worked out quite nicely in that way. Half the time I'm just sitting there outdoors by myself and the students are all online. I mean, I'm not by myself. There's, you know, you're, you're with, where you are in space doesn't really matter, I don't think, a whole lot. It's like graph theory. <laughs> it's all about the connections. And so, uh, which I use as an example in the graph theory class that I'm teaching online. <laughs> all right, uh, you ready to go, Robert? Gosh, I think I am. Are you okay. ready? Uh, I think we're ready here. Um, can everybody hear me okay? Uh, yes, I can. I have Yes, I can. Okay, great. Oh, I don't have to arrange the recording this time. It's such a luxury. 
Am I literally going right now? Um, uh, yes, please. Uh, cool. Hello, everybody. Uh, How are you? Uh, if you have like a, a front page, I, I can introduce you in your title. Oh, I have a front page. I'm so sorry. Do you want me to just put it up on share screen? Uh, yes, please do. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I like that. Um, um, no I'm worries. Always, I'm always so, such a wild card in a talk. I don't mean to be. Okay, hang on. I'm getting there. And here we go. Thank you. Okay. Uh, let's see. So the bottom of your slides are not visible. Uh, yeah, that's because I apparently don't have it set in the right mode. Oh my gosh, you're kidding me. What? Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. I'm so sorry. Uh, I think old method is maybe what you want. The full screen old method. Thank you. Okay. Full screen old method. Yes. Thank you, old method. Okay. All right. Uh, great. Uh, so our next speaker is going to be Robert Schneider at the University of Georgia, and he's going to be speaking on analysis and combinatorics of partition zeta functions. Hello, everybody. How are you? It's great to see you all. Thank you so much for coming to my talk, and thank you very much to the conference organizers for having me. Um, today is a very special pants for me um, in that, oh, wait, hold on. Let me, I have to take command of my computer. There we go. Well, first of all, five years ago, uh, this session was my first pants conference, and it was at Emory while I was still a graduate student there. Earlier that year, 2015, um, on Pi Day, actually, I was trying to come up with like a dank formula for Pi to post onto um, my Facebook page, um, of course. And so uh, along the way, I noticed that you could use partitions to calculate Pi. And as I went down that rabbit hole, I found over the course of some months that there was um, a whole class of uh, partition zeta functions and other series that were analogous to the Dirichlet uh, series and L functions and other objects that we are very familiar with and we all love. Okay, in any event, I gave my first talk on this at Pants. It turned out to be part of my, uh, a large part of my PhD dissertation. And um, at that same conference, on the day I spoke, I came in a little late, as I remember. And I walked in um, at the back of the large room at Emory, and I looked over and there was an extremely dapper looking mathematician. He was dressed up like G.H. Hardy, wearing like a tweed suit with like a vest and a bow tie and stuff. And um, I was like, I like your, uh, your, your bow tie <laughs> or something like that. <laughs> and like, uh, um, as I was trying to sneak into the, uh, the talk from the back. And um, later on that day, uh, we got to chatting and it turned out both of us had become interested in a, uh, the quantity that is the product of the parts of the partition. The product of the parts of a partition isn't something that necessarily at first feels natural to study. But in fact, it's like the other obvious thing to do with a bunch of integers besides adding them. So it's not that unnatural. And in any event, uh, that was Drew Sills that I met on that day, who is the co-author on this paper that I'm presenting. And so I would like to say happy collaborator versary to Drew. And uh, thank you to Pants for being the venue at which I gave my first talk on this subject that turned out to be a big part of my uh, research. And also uh, where I met my friend and collaborator, uh, Drew. Cool. So a uh, happy collaborator versary, Drew, and thank you to Pants. Okay, moving on. Um, going further down the rabbit hole of uh, partition zeta functions, um, I uh, ended up uh, working out kind of um, a, a multiplicative theory of partitions that is analogous in almost every way to um, multiplicative number theory, that is the theory of primes, divisors, arithmetic functions, uh, Euler products and that kind of thing. There is, exists a parallel theory that we're going to discuss now in partition theory. And um, it all started for me uh, with a, an observation about the work of Euler, who is one of my heroes. So um, here I'm going to show the formula that Patrick showed in the previous talk, which is Euler's partition generating function formula. On the left hand side, we have um, an infinite product and it's going through a really nice easy sequence of um, integers there, you know, the whole numbers, n equals one, two, three, and so on, on the product side. On the sum side, that like magically generates the really obscure sequence of integers that is the partition numbers. And so um, in addition to giving a handy way to actually compute partition numbers without having to count them, um, this also connected the theory of analysis to the theory of arithmetic in, um, in, in a really, um, what's the right word, uh, suggestive way. 
by doing this, Euler basically invented one of the templates for how we do partition theory. That is, we use generating functions and we explore them analytically as well as combinatorially. It's very impressive that he thought of this um, and it's a very beautiful formula. On the other hand, um, Euler also dropped the uh, product formula for the zeta function, and this is mind-blowing in its own way. Now, here we don't have the nice, easy set on the left-hand side that we're scanning through in the product. We get that on the right-hand side. We're scanning through this really easy um, P-series from calculus where, oh gosh, look at that. Those should be Ks, not Ns. I'm so sorry for that. I wonder if I can change that right now. Nope, it's not worth doing it, even though I am in LaTeX. Um, and so uh, Euler, on the one hand, connected the sequence of reciprocals of the integers to the sequence of primes in the product, which again is really impressive that he was able to take a pretty easy looking infinite series whose convergence at the time had just been discovered in that era and to connect it to the sequence of primes that had been studied going back, well, in the archeological record, at least 20,000 years. This is a really uh, impressive move as well. Uh, kudos to Euler. And um, seeing these two things side by side and studying these things very deeply um, in graduate school, um, it sort of hit me that the proofs feel similar to these, right? Like if you know the proof of this, you know that it basically, you, 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 uh, you write this out as a product of geometric series, you expand those, collect the terms, and you get this side. Similarly, that's one way to look at a proof for the Euler product formula for the zeta function. Expand these as geometric series, multiply them out, and you get the reciprocals of all the integers. So the proofs really feel different. Now, the analysis is different. The regions that these are convergent are very different, and the feel of them is different. This one encodes addition. This one encodes multiplication. But when we're talking about feel, the feel of them on sort of a meta level is almost identical. You've got some things, you expand them, you multiply them out and you get the other thing. And does it matter what the things that you're expanding and multiplying out are when it comes to just the pattern of how they um, are, are put together in the, in the series? Of course not. That's combinatorics. The patterns, the abstract patterns of the combinatorics are floating above the number theory in a sense, reaching down into both this formula and this formula and making them happen on the left side and the right side. To me, that feels very mystical. And so um, going in this direction, well, it turns out that there's a lot more um, in the multiplicative direction that I'm not going to go into in this talk. It's kind of like my jam is working on that right now. Um, uh, but uh, what I do want to uh, say is that there's a certain philosophy that I see uh, um, uh, emerging out of the study of partition theory and multiplicative number theory um, taken as one picture. And this was sort of the central philosophy of my PhD dissertation. Um, basically, the idea is that there exists multiplicative, there's a multiplication operation, a division, there are arithmetic functions and other uh, multiplicative types of operations and objects that are available in partition theory. And in fact, objects in classical multiplicative number theory, the phi function, the Merbius function, zeta functions, these kinds of things, um, uh, the fundamental theorem of arithmetic, that these are actually special cases, not just analogs, but special cases of partition theoretic structures that hold true on much more general domains of, or, or much more general sets of partitions. Also, one might expect arithmetic theorems, the theorems of, uh, about divisor sums and uh, zeta functions and Dirichlet series and things like this to extend to partition theoretic analogs or generalizations rather. And on the other hand, now this is a little bit more uh, esoteric. One might expect partition properties, things like bijections and other beautiful um, things that we study in partition theory to extend in some sort of a crazy and um, maybe perhaps even um, unrecognized way into properties of integers. Not only do theorems from arithmetic extend into partition theory, but one might also ex expect theorems that are special to partition theory to maybe say something new about the integers and the number line. Okay, so let's run through a few notations. Many of these Patrick gave in his previous excellent talk. Let's let MathCalP be the partitions. That is all ways to add numbers to get other numbers. Um, we're going to let the empty set denote the empty partition, the partition with no parts. 
we're gonna write for the sake of this talk, a partition this way. Lambda is the variable for a partition. And we see that the parts are in weakly decreasing order. For instance, here's one. And if we let mathcal p sub x, we'll let x be a subset of natural numbers. So then this p sub x is going to denote partitions whose elements all come from that subset, right? Like, well, here, let's see. This is the prime partitions, partitioned into prime parts. If it were p sub 2n, two, two then it would be partitions into even parts, and so on. Cool? OK. Uh, here are a few more notations. We're going to let uh, L of a partition, L of lambda, be the length, the number of parts. We're going to let M sub I be the multiplicity or frequency of the part. So that's how many times I shows up in the partition as a part. Um, we're going to use this uh, notation for the, the, su the size or the sum of the parts is the natural, uh, the, the uh, absolute value. And we're going to let um, lambda um, V, I think this is V dash, n, that's in uh, LaTeX, mean that uh, lambda is a partition of n. So this is saying, um, this is describing the set of partitions of n as a property. The length, the size, and the multiplicity of any part in the empty partition are going to be considered to be zero. We're also going to be considering uh, the empty partition to be the partition of zero. OK, so now let's introduce partition zeta functions. Now, in analogy with the Riemann zeta function, which is right here, we all love it so much. I put it in the talk just so that everybody's hearts would get warm at this moment. That's not true, actually. I put it in the talk because everything else hinges on it. But it does make one's heart warm, doesn't it? We're going to define a partition zeta function. So for p dash or p, p uh, prime being a subset of the partitions, not the whole set of partitions, but a proper subset and for s a complex number um, whose uh, exact value and real part and so on will depend on what is to come, we define a partition zeta function to be this sum, okay? Zeta sub the set, c p um, prime is the set, subset of partitions of s, is the sum over all partitions in the subset of the reciprocal of the norm of the partition. Now, the norm is the thing I brought up at the beginning as the thing that Drew and I were both interested in. In fact, Drew and I named it the norm based on a comment of Ken Ono's. Um, and so, um, and it does, it does act in partition theory like norms do in other places such as algebraic number theory. This is truly analogous and it's multiplicative. So the norm of the partition is the product of the parts. And again, while this is not something that has been um, commonly studied on its own as an object up until more recent years. Um, the norm does show up throughout the literature, at least in the last 100, 150 years um, on partition theory. And so um, the product of parts, I noticed it as a thing and Drew noticed it independently as a thing in the literature and we both studied it. And so um, this was the sparking of our friendship and collaboration. If one is in the subset of partitions BTW, right? I'm sorry, if one is not in the subset, because if one is in the subset, then the same partition shows up infinitely often, possibly, since the one doesn't make a difference in the norm, the product. So if one is not in the subset of partitions, and if we let the subset of partitions be uh, all the parts being in some subset of natural numbers, x, then we get an Euler product formula. So the Euler product is here. It's really obvious, actually, if you just look at the right-hand side and multiply it out in your mind. You see that it equals this. Okay, so I just want to show how the thing that's important here isn't so much the, the, the argument S. I mean, that's important from an analytic perspective, but just as important from an analytic perspective is the subset of partitions that we're summing over. So in partition zeta functions, it, it, we kind of have two arguments. We have the complex number and we have the subset. Subsets also change the values of the function as well as the domain and all of the other properties. So for instance, let's fix the argument to be two, kind of a famous one for the zeta function, and let's vary the subset to see how we get different values. Well here, if we wanna sum over partitions into prime parts, well by the definition of the zeta function, this is really just the Riemann zeta function. It is the zeta function. The, the partitions into prime parts are, uh, in a, are in bijection with the, um, 
uh, with the factorizations of the integers. We get pi squared over six, whoopsie. If we sum over partitions into even parts, we get pi over two. This is interesting because um, the Euler, uh, Euler's evaluations of the zeta function only give us odd powers of pi. Here's one where we get, uh, I mean, sorry, they give us even powers. Here's one where we get an odd power. And if we sum over partitions into distinct parts, then um, at the same argument too, we get that it's the hyperbolic sine of pi over pi. That's such a weird quantity to show up. The hyperbolic sine of pi, it, that's not even like really a thing in trigonometry, but it is a thing in the theory of partition zeta functions. There are also partition zeta function analogs of other classical identities. For instance, um, just trust me that these are partition theoretic analogs of the Mervius function and the, um, the uh, uh, Euler phi function. And we get these analogs. And notice that these are very general. These look exactly like the classical cases. The classical cases um, uh, are the case where x is the subset of primes. These, um, these identities, in fact, extend, the same identities extend over all partitions into any random subset of natural numbers, uh, where the parts are drawn from a subset of natural numbers. This is quite interesting to see these same identities show up in an extremely general way like this. The takeaway from these examples is that different subsets of partitions induce different zeta values, not just the argument. And also, classical zeta function theorems actually do extend to partition zeta function theorems. That goes back to expecting that our um, arithmetic theorems will extend into partition theory. So this is all pretty cool. But it would be a whole lot cooler if we had families of identity like Euler zeta values, right? Like, it's really cool to see lots of weird places and pies showing up and stuff. But it would be a lot cooler if we had something like this beautiful uh, general formula shape, like Euler's zeta values, where on the one hand, we have the zeta functions are equal to some rational multiple of a power of pi. That would be the most awesome. What we saw were pi showed up in those cases, but um, it wasn't something like this where it generalized over all arguments. So a question one might ask is, are there partition zeta functions such that for the right choice of the family or of the subset of partitions that we are summing over, that we get something that looks like this, a partition zeta function version of Euler's, Euler's zeta values, where we get a rational multiple of a power of pi. Well, of course, I'm asking it to set up the next slide. Of course, we do have this. It turns out that if you sum over partitions of fixed length, so all partitions having k equals five parts, for instance, right? That's infinitely many partitions. There's lots of them. But even so, we're fixing the length of the partition. Then we can define this zeta function. Notice the notation here that I'm introducing. Zeta over um, partitions of length k. That's what this little k up here denotes. And I basically just ripped off um, the notation from multiple zeta values theory. And so um, in any event, um, this is the zeta function of partitions summed over uh, of, of the norm, the reciprocal of the norm to the s power summed over partitions of length k. This is, a, this is one really nice family of partition zeta functions. So it turns out that if you sum over partitions of fixed length k greater than zero, at the argument s equals two that we looked at before, it turns out that we get rational multiples of pi, of powers of pi. And in fact, it turns out that at s equals two, this partition zeta function uh, is equal for any k to a rational multiple of the Riemann zeta function. We know all of these values, therefore we know all of these values. So that's like really cool because uh, in the zeta function case, well, okay, I just wanna note that this is a single argument but we're varying the subsets, the lengths of partitions, and we see that we are um, over here varying the arguments of the original zeta function. Um, note that if you set k equals zero, it actually gives the correct value for the, um, the value of the zeta function that comes from analytic continuation. 
um, with two of my collaborators, Ken Ono and Larry Rowland, um, we found the next year that in fact, this extends further, this identity extends to any even argument and any length of partition. We get rational multiples of powers of pi, even powers of pi. And this is really fascinating. I just wanna point out that the, um, the K equals one case is all of Euler's cases, partitions into of length one, just the number itself. So here we have infinitely many generalizations of Euler's theorem, the K, the, the K equals one case. So there are also other partition zeta functions um, and some of them continue uh, to, uh, are, can be analytically continued to the right half plane. And the analysis of partition zeta functions for general S in general uh, is, is a little mysterious. I mean, we have infinitely many subsets of partitions we could be summing over. It's an extremely general class. That there's even one other nice class wasn't obvious to me in advance beyond the, um, the Eulerian case. I didn't even uh, know if these were convergent and it turns out that we have all of these nice classes. So a natural question one might ask based on those observations is for a general argument S in the complex plane, can we give similar types of explicit formulas? Can we say anything about analytic continuation for these partitions, the ones that, the, the nice ones where we're summing over partitions of fixed length? Can we say anything about the poles? How about the roots of those functions? Those are really big deals in zeta function theory. This is where uh, Drew uh, came in. About two years ago, I was walking um, uh, at George Andrews' birthday conference, actually, and it was a beautiful day, similar to today, and it was sunny, um, and um, there were birds singing, and I suddenly realized this theorem. I just knew it. Uh, my, my brain proved it instantly because of the birds singing and the wind and the sunlight, and I just knew that this theorem was true. And uh, for about a year, I was unable to come back to it and prove that it was true. And it was really distressing to me because I really needed to put it into, um, uh, I really needed it to fit into my theory just right. And it did fit just right, but I was unable to prove it and I became convinced that it was wrong. So I called Drew up and I was like, I, I, I was really like torn up and I was like, I can't prove this theorem and I know it's true and I don't know how I proved it, the sunlight and the birds. And he thought about it and the next day he texted me and he had found one example in which it was true and he did some computations and he found it that they, that they computed and that was a relief. And the next day he gave me a combinatorial proof of the theorem that I had thought was true but wasn't able to prove by any means and then I was able to backwards engineer it from his proof to, uh, to actually prove it analytically. But the fact is that for a general um, complex number with real part greater than one, the partition zeta function where we're summing over partitions of length k, here we have the length k on this side, can be written as a linear combination of Riemann zeta values weighted with some rational numbers um, over partitions of k. Notice we have length k here on the left side. And on the right side, we're looking at a linear combination over partitions of size k, which is kind of weird. So that's what this is saying. Now noting that we know the analytic continuation properties for um, the zeta function itself, um, this left-hand side, our, our partition zeta function, inherits analytic continuation from this Riemann zeta function. Going through here and looking at the poles, we find that we have poles at all of these values, the, at one, one half, one third, and so on, up to one over k. That's because one of these um, is infinite or has a pole at each of those values. Um, and it inherits the trivial roots from the Riemann zeta function at well, as well at um, negative uh, even integers. And so it turns out that we kind of know basically everything that there is to know, at least, well, there's a lot we don't know, but we, we know we're able to answer the first line of questions that one might ask about a, uh, um, a zeta function. And notice that this zeta function is not zero at the roots of the Riemann zeta function. All of these zetas are not gonna vanish at once. If some of them vanish, then other ones don't. How would one prove something like this? Well, I told you it's the birds and the wind and the sunlight. It's those are the ingredients for many great math proofs. Um, but if one wanted to do it analytically, let me check the time, 20. Ooh, oh my gosh, I'm running out of time. I'm going to scan through the proof and just show you 
that you can prove it here from Father Bruno's formula using generating functions. Rewrite the left-hand side. See, this is, very, this is a somewhat clever use of exponential functions and the Taylor series of the logarithm. You combine it with Father Bruno's formula and it all flows through that we get the thing at the end and then compare coefficients. And you see that the partition zeta function is equal to this thing. Sorry to scan through that so quickly. I'm gonna scan even more quickly through the next part. The combinatorial proof that Drew very brilliantly gave in a short period of time. So I can only do this on a case by case basis. It goes down differently, but for length k equals, for length two partitions, the easiest possible case besides length one, and we're gonna use compositions of length k, that is unordered partitions. Now, I'm just gonna really fast just show you that you start with the partitions of length two. This is what the sum is explicitly. This splits up into a product of two series. You can multiply those together here in a clever way. Uh, you, these are using standard um, analytic classical type of techniques. And then a bunch of fancy combinatorics happens in the indices, which I don't have time to show you right now and I'm sorry for that because it's very interesting. And in the end, it all pans out that it turns out to be true in the S equals, in the K equals two case. For the K equals three case, it's way longer, many, many slides. And for K equals four and so on, it would make um, a, a, a quite a tedious talk, I believe. Um, but just know that there's a strategy of splitting and reorganizing and doing combinatorics in the indices that's very interesting and generalizes. And in fact, it mimics Drew's proof of McMahon's partial fraction decomposition of the partition function. Now check it out. Here is a famous classical formula of McMahon. On the left-hand side, we have this product. It's the generating function for partitions um, whose largest part is less than or equal to K, or alternately, whose length is less than or equal to K. And on the right-hand side, we have something that looks very similar to our formula, but with these geometric series up in there. Now, we don't really want to use this. We want to multiply it by Q to the K to get the combinatorics we need. If you do that, then McMahon's partial fraction looks like this. It's the sum over partitions of length K. And on the right-hand side, it's a linear combination of these um, geometric series and some other rational weights. So the left-hand side generates partitions with largest parts K. And on the right-hand side, we have partitions um, of size K, which is very interesting. The, the switch between largest part and length BTW, one way to look at that is through conjugation of the partitions. Well, here's Drew's and my formula. And if you look at the two formulas together, look at the correspondence between this and that, between this and that, right? And then between this and that, you see how similar they really are. I would like to refer back to the first slide where I showed Euler's formulas, the product formulas for the partition generating function and the Euler product formula for the zeta function. Now, these are the analogies that we're seeing in this, comparing the formulas on the previous slide. In our generating functions from McMahon, Q to the size of the partition seems to be formally analogous to the norm to the minus S power. The norm again is the product of the parts. This geometric series seems to be analogous to this zeta function. And this, this Q series, of uh, this generating function the generating function for partitions of length k is analogous to our zeta function generating function. Note that this, this is the fundamental analogy in the top row between this, that takes the size and the, and to the norm. So basically what we're doing is we're generating partitions here. These both generate a partition in the same way. They generate the same partition. They just give us different analytic and arithmetic objects. The combinatorial pattern is the same pattern. There's no difference. I'm not seeing this as being any different. I have to like really think hard now to be able to see that those Qs and lambdas are giving us something different. So I see just a pattern. In the geometric series, this term and the corresponding term in the zeta function, both encode the partition N with J repetitions. That's what we're using here and that's what we're generating. So see, here are our generating functions for the zeta function and for one zeta function components and one geometric series component. This correspondence says that geometric series, this geometric series, 
and this zeta function, zeta of js, are actually interchangeable as generating functions for partitions that are j repetitions of the same part. They look different analytically, they're different numerically, but they are the same from the combinatorial perspective. A few follow-up uh, thoughts are that partitions of this shape must be important. All the same part, it seems very simple, and yet they are encoded by both of these infinite series that are foundational in analysis and number theory. Do they enjoy other interesting connections, these simple partitions? And with that, I come to the end of my talk, which ran a little over, and I'm sorry for that. And I would like to thank you all so much for listening. Thank you all to the wonderful speakers for your great talks. And thank you to Pants and Pajamas for organizing uh, uh, the session and for bringing us all together. It's so nice to see you all. Thank you very, very much, everybody. All right, thank you. Uh, let's, let's give Robert a virtual round of applause uh, for a fantastic talk. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'm so sorry for running over. Uh, no worries. Uh, any questions? Yeah, Robert, I have a question. Yes. Um, oh, is I this, uh, is, who's, who's speaking here? Is this for me? Oh, yeah. Hey, Larry, how are you? Hey, good. Um, well, I was just wondering what you were saying about the, you know, the connection with Euler's formula for zeta of 2k and the multiple zeta values. Um, I just wonder if there's a, like a one more variable version or something that's like a partition Eisenstein series or something. Uh, you know, okay. like, uh, I just want to say right now really fast, you just named my next paper's title. It's already the paper I'm working on with my uh, student, Matt Just or with my Paul Pollock student, Matt Just, but my collaborator. Okay. And uh, we're writing a paper right now called Partition Eisenstein Series. And um, I would okay. love to hear what your idea about that is because you're much more of an expert on, uh, in fact, can I hit you up soon for us to talk about this? Sure, yeah, and I would mention, um, you know, you mentioned uh, in terms of multiple zeta values, right? There are the relations among them, uh, especially the shuffle and stuffle relations, right? right. And, um, you know, so there's long been a mystery of like where these relations come from and what are all the relations, et cetera. They come um, from Father Bruno's formula, that whole thing. They should yeah. be the same. But there's an Eisenstein series explanation for it too. This is something that Heinrich oh. Hoffman worked uh -huh. on a lot. Um, so I think that Zaghi asked some questions, some people asked some questions on this, but I, I knew Heinrich Bachmann when we were both postdocs in Germany. Um, but he, he developed some like Eisenstein series for multiple zeta values that explains a lot of the relations and stuff too. So that could also be related. That's another Eisenstein analog. Larry, could we talk about that more? Yeah, By the sure. way, Larry, while I have you on tap, I want to thank you for just for introducing me to Father Bruno's formula and discovering all the sick connections between zeta functions and Father Bruno's formula and then writing a paper with me about it. You're awesome. <laughs> thank right. you. Well, yeah, that, that's a cool new result um, that you have with, with Drew. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. It, was, it builds very strongly on the things you showed me, actually, in the background. I'm sure you saw that as I was giving the talk. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Th thank you for that amazing idea, Larry. Uh, we're going to come back to partitions, um, Eisenstein series. And also, uh, like I said, we're, we're doing a, uh, uh, um, my, my, my collaborator, Matt Just, and I are finishing a paper right now on that topic. Um, although it might be a little different, I think, from what you're saying. And that's why I'm really anxious to talk with you about it. Okay. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. Does anybody else have any other questions? I don't want to keep you all for too long. I'm just really happy to see you, though. Yes, I have a question. Yes, Patrick, hi. Uh, yeah, first, great talk, Robert. Uh, Thank it you was so really much. good. Thank you. Uh, great second. talk to you, Patrick. The, that was so interesting. <laughs> yeah, I would just ask, have you, have you ever actually thought of restricting um, your domain in question? Because I know you were going over all of partitions. Have you thought about going through distinct partitions and stuff like those? Okay, now some of those I've worked out and they turn out to be really, really nice. I, um, I didn't include them in this talk because um, those get, those, there's a whole other universe of those. You're right, you have really good intuition, Patrick. There's a, other, there's a universe of those and those intersect with what Larry was talking about, which is multiple zeta values. Um, however, I've looked at very few of these, okay? This is like a huge, there are tons of part, subsets of partitions that have amazing patterns and uh, bijections in them that I'm sure would make cool zeta function relations. And, and, and it's like, it's almost mind boggling to me to be to even think about where, the, where to start. I would say that there's a lot of interesting, um, uh, a lot, there's more interesting formulas and structures to work out in that direction. Um, like, for instance, looking at partitions into distinct parts. I haven't studied them as deeply in this setting, but they do work out nicely. I'll just say that that relates to the partition version of the Mobius function. 
it kind of filters out the ones that don't have distinct parts. Thank you. That makes sense. Let's, uh, Patrick, I would love for us to talk about that. Could we chat about that maybe next week? Uh, sure. Why not? Okay. If you're interested in it, I would love to, uh, I've always been daunted to look at other subsets, but it would be a really great thing to try out if, uh, if, if you're ever uh, curious. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you for having me, everybody. And thanks for your great talks. It was so nice to see you all. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Robert, for a fantastic talk. Oh, thank you. Thanks, everyone. Okay. And we will uh, reconvene at 1.15. Uh, so I'll see you all there. See you, everyone. So great to see you.